Bartley Cleveland, the commander of U.S. Army Special Operations Command. Um, thanks also for the partnership. I know uh, many familiar faces in, in the crowd. Um, I don't have that much money. You might want to talk to some of the others on the side. I, you know, just to. Um, but uh, this is a good opportunity, really, to talk about uh, you know the partnership that we've I think carried us well through the two significant and, and frankly uh, America's longest war. So uh, it's a successful partnership between industry and the special operations forces. And so uh, I want to thank you for that. Um, I want to make no mistake about it. Our job right now is to win the current fight. And uh, it's not just the fight in Afghanistan. It's, uh, you know, there, we have conflict that uh, is brewing all over uh, or that we're involved in around the world. And, uh, and so as we go through and look to the future, and I'll talk a little bit about the future here in a second, uh, many of the systems and things that you have built out there as the end game starts shaping up for Afghanistan, the reliance on special operations forces, I think it's no secret, is gonna go up. And so uh, many of the, the systems that we've come to rely on to be successful to this point are gonna become ever more important as we get into the end game. So I don't want to not forget the fact that we're still in conflict and as we speak we got young men getting off helicopters or breaking a corner someplace and, and getting shot at or, or killing the enemies of our country. Um, the job at USASOC is to generate and sustain Army soft combat power. And I have, my customers are the uh, JSOC and the TSOC commanders who you heard from yesterday. Um, now they work for obviously the GCCs, uh, for the President, the Secretary of Defense, for ambassadors out there, but regardless, those are my, my primary customers are those two. Uh, those two types of warfighting headquarters that SOCOM now has in its suite of capabilities. As Admiral Craven mentioned yesterday, that I think one of the great break points and inflection points in the development of SOC was getting the TSOCs into the constellation of SOCOM so that SOCOM could adequately support uh, those warfighting nodes that are out uh, actually day in and day out around the world, actually creating the soft global network. Um, the job and, and, and the way we have, the way, way I describe it, the way we describe it at, at USASOC is we have to generate two exquisite capabilities for the country. One exquisite capability that you know I call a surgical strike capability, a strike capability that gives the that gives the nation this ability to project power at scale up to a regiment size if necessary and more if necessary uh, to kill, execute, kill, capture operations, rescue hostages, and uh, execute a variety of sensitive activities, largely unilateral, uh, but can be partnered around the world. The other exquisite capability is what we term the special warfare capability, which is a scale from unconventional warfare to small footprint. And there are degrees on that scale. And I can point to various places around the world where it's not black or white. It's not like all of a sudden you're conducting one UW and then it, it flips necessarily and now you're doing FID. Uh, more often than not, the reality is it's some of these can be happening simultaneously. Uh, they can, you can be doing FID one day and then all of a sudden parts of where you were operating become a denied area and so now you are left with having to use potentially things that you build and you have to do unconventional work. Or at least you have to have that option. So the country needs two, two of these two exquisite capabilities. And frankly, they approach uh, the business differently. On the one side of the house, uh, we approach uncertainty by doing everything we can and many of you are involved in this by squeezing out the uncertainty in the problem before we put operators on the objective. Because we want to make sure we don't fail. Those are no-fail missions. And so there's a whole constellation of intelligence apparatuses out there that uh, are designed to make sure that when, we, when the decision is made to execute, that the advantage is on our side because we will not fail. And we will continue to do that. On the other side, and, and, and that's how we deal with uncertainty there. Frankly, though, there are other parts uh, and problem sets where you can't know everything that you need to know without wading into it. 
And so we build forces that can self-sustain and actually go into uncertainty. Largely in the human problems where you, you don't know intent or you're trying to manipulate intent. And that I think the country needs, uh, again, the capability of regionally expert forces. Men and women that understand the language, understand the culture, understand the connections, how to basically message, influence, befriend, and necess when necessary, kill or have them help us to achieve an objective, perhaps joining together to kill the enemies of our country. So the country needs both of these capabilities. And frankly, as the world situation continues to uh, develop out there, as, as Sean was talking about, mega cities and the development, this whole idea of a human domain, which is again something that Admiral Craven is championing here, I think is becoming increasingly uh, relevant. And certainly it's, it's something that we need to consider because it becomes a domain because you have to develop Doppel PF solution sets to fight there. And Doppel PF solution sets represent business for you. How do we fight inside of these mega cities? The tools that we have traditionally built in our land domain war and even in our maritime domains largely are not appropriate for the kinds of combat that you have to fight there. And so uh, we have to make a study of that. We have to go through the analysis to figure out what is it that you need and how do you, what do your formations need to look like? How do you educate the operators? How do you train on top? What does the organization that you put into that environment need to look like? And it doesn't look like your, you know, normal Napoleonic staff, nor is it two up, one back, and cabin the swamp. So, uh, and this is the metamorphosis, this is part of the change, I think, that SOCOM is leading, uh, leading the effort in DOD. Um, on taking over, I essentially assessed, uh, from, uh, from John, as, as we looked at the command, that uh, we have seams, gaps, and one uh, emerging area of, of development that's required. The first seam is between the Army Soft component and the conventional force. And it's really not only Army Soft, it's all soft. And the conventional forces on the battlefield. We spent 12 years fighting alongside each other, um, or, and you know, in some ways fighting against each other or with each other, bureaucratically certainly uh, at, at, at the beginnings. We, de we developed tremendously over the battlefield, basically, uh, was a forcing function for us to figure out how to, how to work together. And so, that's one scene, though. We've got, we cannot lose what we've developed over the last 12 years, and, and I'm happy to say that I think we're taking the steps to not do that. The, the other scene is the scene with the interagency. And Joe talked a little bit about this, but we, we have de developed, again, some great uh, tools and TTPs to work with the interagency and frankly the non-governmental organizations that we work with out on the battlefield. Uh, the, uh, I was talking to one of the ASDs at, uh, or the uh, assistant secretaries rather at the State Department and you know, he talked about this, you know, we ought, to, we ought to form up this league of extraordinary operators because we all, we all generally find ourselves on the same battlefield uh, as we descend upon a problem. We ought not wait until we have to descend on the problem to create this, this connection, and we're starting to work on that. And so those are the two gaps, or two seams, rather. The, other, the gap is uh, the one area that we need to get back into in Army Soft is we have these regionally expert forces, but we surged to Iraq and Afghanistan and by necessity, and we sacrificed, I think, over the last 12 years, the deep knowledge and expertise that we need in the rest of the world. Not to say we don't have it, it's just we don't have it in the density that we need, and so that's, that's the gap that we, we, we're going to work to fix. And the last emerging piece is this idea of operational art, soft operational art. Uh, so those are, if you will, the four pillars of what uh, USASOC uh, sees as, as its way ahead. And to get at those, we've established six priorities. Investing human capital. Some of you are involved in that. It's not only the training piece, it's the education piece. SWIC's got some great initiatives going on. We have master's degree programs today where we have enlisted personnel and, and uh, warrants as well as commissioned officers from across the force that are getting their masters because we need in the force, again, these regionally expert forces, men and women who understand to a deeper level what's going on in their respective parts of the world. 
right, so invest in human capital. We have to optimize now this relationship with these conventional forces and, and the interagency. We don't fight independently. You know, the fifth soft truth says we have to we have others to fight along with us. That includes the interagency. We have this region, these regional expert forces when they're not forward, in my view, that we need to continue to capitalize on their expertise. So we're developing processes that can reach us, reach back from the theater. And so these regionally expert forces that are at Bragg and other places around the U.S. are involved in the fights, helping the TSOC with their problem sets so they're not at rest. It's you know, artillery, like artillery, if you will. We don't keep it in reserve. In my view, in the 21st century, you can't leave regionally expert forces in reserve. They need to be engaged uh, within the fight. The next priority is this idea of developing at the SOF at the operational level, and it's really special operations at the operational level, and then the other is SOF operational part, which is a field of its own, and one that I think represents the next horizon for SOCO. So we're going to get at this. These, uh, those are the, the four, uh, first four. The next one is SOF uh, mission command. The TSOCs have talked about SOC forwards. We have small nodes. Frankly, we're not organized to put those small nodes out on the battlefield. They're all ad hoc. We have to figure out a way to standardize the practice to do that, to include the technology behind it, the reach back idea. And then the last part is optimize our resources and our commodity areas. And you know, frankly, what, what we built to fight in the last two wars together is not what we need for near future. And so we're undertaking a process of both experimentation and change to reshape our force. And the idea is to get better, not bigger. And if we got to get smaller to get better, then, then that's a risk we may have to seriously consider. And so those are, uh, that's the approach USAC is taking. Uh, we, I'll shamelessly promote the little book here. We have this uh, out at the uh, component table. Uh, it outlines essentially what we're looking to do. And then the back part of it, in those six priority areas, there's over 100 initiatives that we're looking at for the short, midterm, and long term that you may want to take a look at. There may be something in there that you can help us with. So again, thank you for your time. Well, thanks, Charlie. And in 